Good day, everyone. Richard Copperthwaite for Northwest Access TV. Thanks for joining us. Happy to have a couple of folks on board. Franklin County Sheriff Roger Langevin. Roger, good to see you. Thanks, Thanks for coming here. on. And Franklin County Sheriff's Department Captain John Grismore. John, good to see you. Thank morning, you very Richard. much for coming on. Thanks I should note me. at the start, we're taping this show on, uh, where are we, Monday, May 17th. And uh, Board Sheriff, probably I would think about the biggest news with the Sheriff's Department or in maybe quite a while, but come July 1st, uh, your department will, of course, be taking over the contract for patrolling covering St. Albans Town. Big, big news, and I'm sure that's been keeping even busier than usual for a while. Yeah, yeah, we're excited about it. We uh, certainly have made great strides in getting in position to be able to do that yeah. successfully. And, um, you know, and we'll continue um, well beyond, Richard, the yeah. July 1st, you know, time we take over. And again, um, the contract, how are we talking three, three year? What, what's the contract situation for the town? Three years with uh, two one year extensions okay. possible. So. Or City PD's had that contract for, is it close to 10, 10 years or am I a little high? No, I, I'd say it was somewhere around, around there. there. Yep. Uh, yep. And it sounds like I know going back in time, uh, I think the town when the city PD took over from the sheriff's department, I think they had some issues early on. I think that relationship went pretty well, but when you bid for the contract, it sounds like uh, from the town's point of view, they, they just saw the sheriff's department having a, a better deal, but in any case, he got the, he got the contract. Yeah. And I think, Richard, it, it somewhat went even beyond the deal. I think they, um, the culture was very big to me when I became sheriff. And yeah. Um, you know, I want a good work environment. I want well-trained deputies, yeah. um, you know, and I want them all to get along. Uh, it really shows when you go out in the public, and yeah. um, I think we've been pretty successful at that. And, um, and when we pitched ourselves to the town select board, yeah. um, you know, I think they appreciated that. So staffing-wise, are, are you in decent shape now? You still have some more staffing to do? Are you going to be okay staffing-wise with the town? Yeah, I think so. We're, um, you know, we're always looking for a few more. Yeah. Um, and we will be, like I said, after July 1st as well. But so again, we're, we're, anybody out there, uh, anybody interested in being a deputy, talk talk to you. I mean, you're always looking for folks? Oh, absolutely. And our best recruiting tool has been our deputies. Really? Um, you know, by, yeah. by talking to other law enforcement officers, you know, throughout yeah. the state. We have one we just hired from uh, the southern part of the state. Huh. Uh, we have another one who's coming from, uh, well, the eastern part of the Northeast Kingdom. Huh. Um, you know, we have a meeting, meeting actually with him today where he's going to be signing on with us. No, in um, fact, I'm headed for the eastern part of the kingdom uh, later, later today. I have a camp out that way. but So Essex County, nice nice part of the world. Yeah. But I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to gear down than it is to gear up. Yeah, Although it's not, as, it's not as pleasant gearing down. Because, of course, the city PD has been obviously doing just that with uh, right. the town. Yeah. Interesting. So you feel pretty pretty comfortable with uh, with a, a new big assignment, so to speak. We do. We do. We got a good group of folks, and we're uh, yeah. we're eager to do it, anxious to do it. We'll have yeah. a couple of meetings here again, you know, in the next couple of weeks, um, you know, just prior to, and um, yeah, so it's good. Yeah, Captain. Thoughts. Uh, looking forward to you know St. Albans Town. Well, of course, Roger, a long time resident of St. Albans Town. Looking, yeah, for, looking well, forward to it. Sounds like a big challenge, but you're is, up for yeah, it. it. It is a big challenge, but it's it's a lot of fun, too. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's great to see all of the uh, pieces come together. Uh, a lot of financials, obviously, that we're rolling through and making sure that yeah. we're aligned with our budgets. And, and one of the things that we've committed to, um, we built it into our proposals, is, is, you know, spending town money like it's our money, you know, and we take that very seriously. So when it comes to things like looking at cruisers, we don't get the most expensive cars that are out there, you know, we get something that's going to be good, reliable, going to have a good cost of ownership yeah. and is going to, you know, stay within the budget guidance that we committed to. So uh, as, as an aspect, you know, and I know that the budget, um, you know, and the monies that the, uh, that the contracts have been increased over this last year is, has been a topic of conversation for a lot of the communities. And, yeah. and uh, to that point, you know, we recognize that when we came in, you know, when the sheriff came in, one of the first conversations we had was about, um, well, really three things, you know, and we, we share these three things with everybody we talked to, and uh, one being culture, right? The sheriff talked about the culture and how uh, we wanted to make sure that we had the right culture um, with the right people that had the right motivation and were doing the job for the right reasons uh, and had the right support. Uh, with the other thing was pay, uh, and the third thing being benefits. Uh, so the pay and benefits component, we didn't have a lot of control over because that's driven by our contractual, yeah. you know, our contractual dollar amount, if you will. So um, we've, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of uh, closed door meetings about how to re really approach that, 
uh, intelligently and and fairly. And you know, we we recognize that our uh, pay structure was among the lowest in the state. Really. And so in terms we needed of to make sheriff's department. The sheriff's department. Yep, yep, ours was comparatively yeah. with you know the Vermont State Police or municipal uh, organizations and other yeah. and even other sheriff's departments. Yeah. So we we knew we had a lot of work to do there, and um, you know, and that really translated into the structure of the uh, policing services proposals that we made because we knew that um, you know it would be a there would be some sticker shock with the communities because we are increasing that price yeah. but a necessary uh, a necessary increase you know our, our folks we've got really really good folks and they deserve to be paid better you know they deserve to be uh, in a competitive wage scale with their peers throughout the state mm -hmm. um, we also recognize that our benefit program wasn't where it needed to be and uh, it, it's actually a pretty good program for a single person, but it's a horrible program for a family. Right. And, and something that, that uh, you'll hear the sheriff talk a lot about is that the concept of family, you know, and that we want our organization to be like a family, but we also recognize that we want people to also have that same kind of family value. And, and how can we attract and retain those folks if we don't have, you know, benefits packages for them to, yeah. to make our organization attractive there? You know, they can love the job. But if it's not, you know, competitive pay and it's not providing the benefits that they need for them and for their families, then, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of a lost cause. So, so we built a lot of that into it, you know, and that, then that's really the main driver behind the contractual increases that we've had this year and right. in line with what we put together for St. Albans Town. And, and, um, and we really tried to make that, that budget uh, very thin, you know, so we're, we don't overinflate it. We didn't, you know, grossly overestimate the monies that we're going to need from any of our communities. We, we put a lot of time, a, a lot of time and a lot of effort into really keeping that number as low as possible, you know, and, and, and we really look at, at our budget as being a, you know, a, a, almost an even budget, you know, because we recognize that if, if the money is coming in, then we have an opportunity to pay more money out, right? So better investments in training, better investments in equipment, better investments in our people. Um, but also being very, very conscientious about that, uh, you know that dollar amount that we're translating to the to the taxpayers. Yeah, and the budget. Last time I talked to you, Roger, we talked about this. But for some folks out there, what what's the big deal with the budget? Don't you know taxpayers approve it? Obviously, you're in a very different situation from say St. Albans PD, whose budget is part of the city budget, which voters have approved uh, pretty easily for maybe the last 15, 20 years. Your situation, obviously, is a lot a lot different. So contract, how important are contracts with towns? Or maybe just talk about where, where your money, the money you need, comes in from different, different places. Yeah, um, sheriff's departments are unique in the sense that they're um, a, a business. They, they run themselves. They have to generate their own revenue. Is that typical of all, all states? Do you know of many other states, how, how, how they work or no, not? No, many of them, uh, many of the sheriff's offices are county um, government, yeah. if you will. Yeah. So they, uh, they get the county budgets to help run their uh, their organizations. Yeah. I visited uh, Pinellas huh. County, Florida Sheriff's Office, as well huh. as Orange County, Florida's office. Huh. Um, you know, they're 2,400 and 3,000 deputies uh, strong themselves. Is that, is that and, right? And they get a healthy yeah. county budget. Huh. Um, you know, this government in Vermont isn't set up that way for, to run the Sheriff's Office. County uh, government's not, not real big in, <clears throat> in Vermont. Uh, no, I another guess, maybe. statutorily required yeah. to do is provide an office for the Sheriff's Office. Yeah. Uh, as well as some, you know, cover the, the expenses of the sheriff's office. And yeah. then after that, the sheriff's department has to generate their own revenue. Yeah. So that's where, as, as John was mentioning, it's very important for us to collect what we can in revenue to help pay the bills. If we yeah. don't do that, we're, we could essentially go out of business if wow. we don't generate enough revenue. There's uh, some outside money. Is it your salary? That's, does the state kick in some money for, you, for the department? The, the state actually pays my salary okay. uh, and also two of the state deputy transport deputies and stuff okay. that are, you know, they have state uh, job descriptions where they, what they must perform. Yeah. Um, but all, all the other deputies that we have on, on board, uh, you know, we, we pay for them. And all the expenses associated with them, or, wow. which are um, have increased a lot, obviously in the last, um, you know, each year it increases, and we have to um, project for those increases. And that's where I, I sit a lot with John, and we go through the yeah. the numbers and, and wow. make sure that we're covering everything with the contracts that we have, because we can't, if gas fluctuates a dollar a gallon, I can't go to legislature and right. ask for another million dollars, you know, the luxury, say, the state police have. Yeah. Um, we have to try to factor that in and try to predict, if we can, where those expenses are going to be covered by. Well, good luck. You want to predict gas? Gas, obviously, up to $3 <laughs> a gallon. Some of my no. friends who are especially not happy with the current uh, 
federal administration saying, hey, Richard, think about $4 a gallon. Who, right. who knows? But that seems to yeah. be going up. So. But that seriously impacts um, you know, our ability to police. I bet. Um, I mean, do you purposely try to do less driving when you run into an issue like that? Do you try to keep doing what you usually do? Or? Well, well, we'll talk to our deputies. Um, you know, we'll, we'll smartly patrol, you yeah. know, spend a little more time in the center of a town versus, yeah. you know, patrolling all around the town type of yeah. thing. Um, you know, the other side to that is, Richard, other people are driving less as well. Right. And motor vehicle work is probably 80 to 90 percent of what we do. Right. So if the less cars on the road, then there's less really, um, yeah. you know, need for us to really be on those back roads. But yeah. currently, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's something we're out on those roads quite often. And speaking of contracts, Sheriff, how many contracts have you got? Have you got like about half, uh, 15 municipalities in Franklin County? Have you got about half of those for contracts? Or uh, Currently we have six. You have six. Six town contracts. Okay. Yep. And St. Albans Town will be the seventh, or will that be the sixth? Uh, that'll be the seventh. That'll be um, the seventh. And, and the contracts vary. Uh, you know, we have someone like Fairfax, the town of Fairfax, it's a seven-day contract. Really? We have uh, Enosburg currently, which is a seven-day contract. Yeah. And Richford, which is a five-day contract. Yeah. Um, and then we have the smaller towns, such as Franklin and also Sheldon, that have, uh, you know, uh, 10 hours per se a week of us uh, yeah. for, for contracted hours. Yeah. Um, so also all those other towns, I mean, obviously state police has jurisdiction everywhere, but those other towns uh, just relying basically on state police, I guess. Uh, on an on-call basis. Uh, on-call on basis. We have a very good um, relationship with the state police. Yeah. So Lieutenant Jerry Parton and I talk often. Of course, you're a former yeah. state police officer yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, we often assist in any way we can. Um, if, if they're stuck at another call, um, you know, we'll step in and, and try to help out if we can. Yeah. Um, but what people need to realize, if it's not a town that we cover, yeah. um, that's something that we're taking out of our own pocket to, um, to respond to. Yeah. And we can't do that too many more, you know, too many times before, you know, we really show a deficit versus, gotcha. you know, a break even. But again, you, you do that on occasion. If you hear a serious issue in Montgomery, you would respond if it looked like you would be the <coughs> first responders to a serious situation or? Well, um, not that not that simple a thing. No, it is. It isn't that simple. It will, um, you know, if, if say this town of Montgomery, and this is an actual story that we had, uh, we're having some parking issues on a particular swimming hole area. Um, hmm. Captain Grismore, who's our financial guy, um, yeah found some Governor's Highway Safety funds, and we went up there on Governor's Highway Safety and huh. did some enforcement on behalf of the town. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we try to do what we can. I'd love to see us in all 15 towns in, really? in Franklin County, or yeah. the towns without police. Um, if we can figure a way to do that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, and I think, Richard, down the road, we're going to be looking, hopefully, at some regionalized policing, where huh. each of the towns contribute. Really? You can pro lower the costs, um, and we'll see, have to see more of a police presence. Um, <laughs> And that's where you spoke about, like in other states. I mean, that's essentially what they do uh, really? with their sheriff's office. They're already countywide yeah. um, in the position and have the structure already in place in which to respond to uh, to that type of policing. Interesting. Is there a case? Uh, I'm thinking of Milton, which of course has its own PD. Maybe not right. the best. Uh, any border towns bordering Franklin County where you ever jump into if you if you happen to have a, a deputy closer to anybody else has that ever happened or pretty much you don't go out of the county unless it's something extremely serious or well, we are very con conscious of the nature of the call yeah um, if it's certainly a priority call it's an all you know all hands on deck type of thing yeah. on any law enforcement in the area if we're close depending on the nature of the call naturally we would respond but we're also very conscientious of that we'll be getting paid by the towns that we're in. Right. Um, so if it's a minor motor vehicle accident, it's just over the town line, yeah. we're not going to respond to that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to stay in the towns that we're in who are paying us to be there. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's, um, you know, they need, a deputy needs to request position, permission from the, uh, you know, shift supervisor before yeah. they leave their patrol area because hmm. um, we're very serious about being in the areas that we patrol. All right. And again, you're a former, of course, St. Albans, uh, former SRO at the, at the town school, but you feel you have pretty good relations with Vermont State Police, St. Albans Police, Wanton Police, with the other Border Patrol, and with the other agencies? Oh, absolutely. Which and, would uh, seem to be huge, hugely important, especially with staffing issues, I know, with State Police and maybe for, well, you know, all the agencies to some extent. Yeah. You know, Richard, there's not enough of us out there. I think yeah. I've said it at every select board meeting I've been to. I've mentioned it to all the yeah. leadership and, and law enforcement. We need yeah. each other. Yeah. Um, we really do. And I think, you know, Lieutenant Parton, Chief Lamoff, and Chief yeah. Stell would say the same thing, that yeah. they can pick up the phone and say, I'm hey, sure. can you help us? And, and we've done it in, in both directions. Yeah. Uh, you know, we Swanton PD has helped us train 
um, and we've done joint training with them through uh, use of force and also CPR oh. training to minimize cost to both of our agencies. Yeah. Um, and that's worked well. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to do that wherever, as Captain Grismore said, we can save money, we're going to do that. Right. Um, and it just makes sense. And it also gets everybody together in law enforcement. To, if you do show up at a complaint, they, they know each other. And yeah. that's important as well. Yeah. So, Captain, the key financial guy, it sounds like, boy, do you ever get out on the road? Are you pretty much uh, behind a desk all day? It sounds like you got uh, plenty to keep you busy, but do you, do you get out at all? I do, yeah. I, um, I, I do still very much enjoy the patrol side of but, things. I always have. Yeah. Um, I think the sheriff wants me to stay behind the desk a little bit more, but I, uh, <laughs> but I, I do. I, enjoy, I, I really do enjoy the whole aspects of that. You know, I, I try to get out, and, and even on my commute to work, you know, if uh, if there's something that I need to deal with, then I'll deal with it. You know, and yeah. and uh, I have a cruiser, so I'll you know if I can respond to something in route or or um, you know or throughout the day. You know, like you talked about some major events. You know, if there's some major crises going on, then yeah. you know I'd like to be able to just grab my gear and get out the door and and help out. So yeah, yeah that's one of the great things about the job is I can you know kind of custom my day around uh, my particular desires and the needs of the business and yeah, yeah but I do still very much like that work. But the financial, so, so again, the sheriff mentioned ideally uh, he'd like to see contracts with um, every, you know, just about everybody in Franklin County have the same, same desire. Is that something you're doing? Are you out trying to get more contracts or anybody in particular, Roger? Is that your job or different people trying to talk to the towns, going to the select board meetings and trying to get more business? Yeah, um, you know, it's kind of twofold. I try to make it to select board meetings just to see what's going on in those towns. Yeah. We certainly care about all 15 towns in Franklin yeah. County. Um, and we've actually pitched, um, you know, like say Fairfield, uh, Bakersfield, and Fletcher as a, as a joint huh. joint contract. But it's a it's a little more tricky when you have three towns voting and that type of thing. Yeah. If one votes and two don't, okay. or one does and you know yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Um, but you know we uh, we've sent people up to Franklin um, or not Franklin. I mean um, Fletcher at the school um, yeah. when they had their graduation during COVID, huh. um, you know, just to help out and, and to help it make more of a festive event. It was one of our state deputies that did that. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so we offer whatever we can um, to those towns that don't have a, a police presence. I, yeah. I think it's very important. We'd love to see it all one day. Um, through COVID, I haven't been able to make it to the select board meetings um, in those towns. But uh, you know, as soon as COVID lifts and they start having them again, we'll certainly get back and face to face with them. And I guess some of some of those meetings starting to come back to face to face. Seems like I'm re reading that or hearing yep. that. Yep, some yeah. are. Yep. I guess that begs an obvious question: with the pandemic, what 14, good 14, 15 months into this. I mean, it's affected you know everybody in the country, probably every organization. What's been the main effect uh, with Franklin County Sheriff's Department with the pandemic? Has that just changed how you've done your business, or a lot of changes, or how have you? How do you think you've fared with that? I think the biggest hit we we've taken is um, outside jobs, such as like road construction, all yeah. got delayed and uh, and pushed back. There wasn't much of that last year. That's Which a huge. That's revenue. Cost, costing you some some money, obviously. That's a huge so a lot of revenue money. loss for right. us. Um, wow. You know, and also civil process with the moratorium has uh, okay. has taken a big hit for us too. And that's another little you know small re yeah. area of revenue for us. Um, so, you know, fortunately, again, I'll, I'll say to John, we just had to tighten our belts. Yeah. Um, you know, we made it through and, um, you know, hopefully things are turning around. Yeah. And I think one of the other impacts that we yeah. had, too, is that, you know, we pride ourselves on being very community oriented. You know, we want our folks to be out and stopping in and saying hello and, yeah. you know, shooting hoops in the street with the kids or stopping in at the stores to say hello or stopping in town halls and those kinds of things. Were, it's very important for us. And COVID pull that away from us you know yeah. we we couldn't allow our folks to be as socially interactive as as we would have yeah. preferred them to be so you know that's been an impact too but but for, you know we we're lucky i think that we uh we took the proper precautions at the right times we you know make sure that we we did have the mask mandates you know for motor vehicle stops and uh and that sort of thing so you know our folks stayed healthy and and uh we were very fortunate you know we didn't we didn't have any major issues in terms of our folks being sick and being out of work and and that sort of thing but i think you know obviously the revenue stream has been a challenge but also too with uh you know we talked about culture before a big part of our culture is that community policing component and and uh we're really optimistic that we're going to start getting back into that swing again you know and mm -hmm. and uh, and that's again that's very important for us yeah uh sheriff back to st albans town we'll 
town residents, will, they, will there be any obvious changes as they, to the extent they're paying attention to law enforcement? Uh, any big changes in how you're thinking to cover, patrol the town or not particularly? Or Well, an advantage we're going to have, Richard, is that um, our two deputies that are going to be seven days a week, 24 hours a day there, will be in the town. Okay. Um, so a sign they'll, they'll just be in the town? No just other. in the town. Okay. Um, you know, barring any, you know, tragic emergency yeah. um, so that that's a huge advantage when you get a call and you're in yeah. the town um, that's nice to be able to respond it shortens response time yeah. um, and also on Friday and Saturday nights we're gonna have a third deputy for eight hours huh. um, I know I say Friday and Saturday nights if they're having an event going on on a Friday it could be during the day but it, it, there'll be an yeah. extra shift on Friday and Saturdays yeah. which is which is quite nice as well and we're also, um, my long range plan with the town is to look at the businesses in the North End and see if we can have a dedicated deputy to work out there in the North End. As you know, it gets, gets busy there. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, you got your, your major box stores out there. Yeah. Uh, there's car dealerships out there, yeah. uh, Highgate Shopping Center. It'd be nice to have a deputy that's there to handle like, you know, the parking lot incidences or maybe the retail thefts or the bad checks that come through there. Yeah. Um, and I think there is room for a full-time position there. Huh. Um, so we're going to approach the businesses and just see what their uh, ability is or their desire to maybe have that full-time deputy there. So there could be a whole other position created uh, as be, the North you, End really grows. Would you be looking or hoping to get some funding from businesses or is that? Yes, I would like it. I would like to have it funded that. by the businesses. Um, I've already approached huh. Walmart. Um, huh. I've got my business card and I talked to the, uh, the loss prevention officer there who's going to run it up their chain huh. um, and set up a meeting. Um, they, they were initially thought it was a pretty good idea. Yeah. Uh, we could have an office there. We'd have a Mark Cruiser there in the area and that type of thing. So it would just make for a much safer, as, as that area continues to grow yeah. and, uh, you know, to have a deputy there full time. Interesting. Yeah, it seems like I, I'll pick up rumblings once in a while, just a fair amount of shoplifting. I mean, uh, Walmart, the biggest place around, but sure. probably a pretty busy place in terms of just issues to deal with out of Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. And again, other uh, places that I've been, other states that I've been, namely Florida, yeah. uh, a, lot, a lot of the big box stores do have a deputy uh, really? there working in that area. So, Interesting. Um, yeah, I think that would be an opportunity for us and for the North End businesses. Yeah, but again, for the town, we're talking 24-7 coverage. We so we're talking as, as much coverage, can you say, uh, in terms of similar time-wise, similar to what the town's been getting with St. Albans PD? Or is that hard to... Uh, well, it'll be more, realistically. It, I mean, they... You think more? Yeah, so, so typically... Uh, St. Albans PD historically has had three people on to cover both the city and the okay. town. Okay. So I'm not sure what they're going to do for numbers to cover yeah. the city, but we're going to have two dedicated to the okay. town. So, so you see it theoretically, it's, it's going to be a whole extra person, right? Yeah. A whole 56 hours a week more uh, because that's that's a whole other person that's going to be there. So, and again, yeah. dedicated to the town. Um, and, and that's, you know, on top of the, the extras that the sheriff commented about, about having, a, you know, the weekends or the Friday, Saturday night covered as well. Yeah. True. I guess city city PD. I guess divided St. Albans city and town into segments. I mean, just from earlier interviews, but whatever. So different situation. You've just got the town, obviously not the city to deal with when you take over. Right. Yeah. Well, the town's very large, and it encompasses the city. Yeah. Um, you know, but we'll stay pretty much on the perimeter of, of, of the city when we respond to things and when we do our patrols. Yeah. Um, obviously, we don't want to duplicate efforts in the city by cutting up through the city. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had those initial talks with our deputies and expectations, and, and we'll formalize it, as I was mentioning, in the next couple of weeks. We'll do, uh, you know, another full-time meeting and then another uh, meeting just prior to taking over the shift of yeah. St. Albans Town. Interesting. St staffing, Sheriff, what, what, is your, what is your staff at this point? Currently, we are 33 deputies, and we're really, really? kind of split um, oh. between, like, the level twos and level three certified in, uh, deputies. Hmm. Um, we have a number of them taking the entrance exam on June 1st, um, additional deputies. Um, so, so we're in good shape to staff with, our, with a complement of our full-time and part-time or level two certified deputies. Yeah. Um, Currently in the state of Vermont, out of the 1,500 uh, law enforcement in Vermont, approximately 333 of them are level two certified. Huh. Um, and then that plays a big role for us because we can grow rapidly and we can also shrink uh, as we need to. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we were committed to the courts with, uh, with four or five deputies per day. Um, you know, we have our two state deputies that we, uh, we, we have as well. Um, so, uh, 
you know, for staffing the town, we have, uh, you know, 12 full timers that uh, we'll be utilizing and we'll be uh, also utilizing, you know, some of the level two certified deputies that we have as well for patrol. So we feel like we're in good shape. Ideally, if we could hire five more full timers, and that's that's our goal. And right. uh, if we could do five more part timers, I would do that as well. Is that, is that so, right? Wow. Yeah. It's right. And again, train board training. If someone wants to be a deputy, I mean, there's obviously significant training to take uh, between what Vermont Police Academy. There's just obviously uh, significant training that anybody goes through, depending on what their background is. I guess obviously. Right. I mean, some people can. If someone's been a veteran deputy sheriff for a number of years, they can come right in. Is there training? they would have to undergo if they're going to a different county or anything like that? Yeah, we would want to put them through an FTO program, yeah. you know, um, and depending on their level of experience and how comfortable they get, that, that FTO program could be shortened. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we have a pretty formalized program that's, uh, you know, state certified um, with yeah. someone coming out, out of the academy. Yeah. So um, you, you're right, it does take, you know, quite a while. It's a huge savings if we can get someone that is level three certified already. I bet. Um, you know, but also we we have a, a, a healthy respect for the level two certifications. Yeah. Uh, we have some level two certified deputies that have been on for you know almost twenty years, and they're just as capable as any level three certified officer. Yeah. Um, they've had that much experience. Um, you know, we have Andre Labure in the, uh, uh, Richford at the high school. He's our SRO. He's a retired huh. U.S. Marshal. Um, huh. He does a great job. Um, you know, he's a level two considered a level two certified. Yeah. officer with us um, so you know we certainly have those that are have the experience that, that we have all the confidence in the world in um, they've done a great job they've proven themselves uh, yeah. so yeah so getting back to your question we're 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 good to, to start the town we're excited um, yeah. you know but we'll continue I think the policing business is you're always looking for good qualified individuals I'm sure uh, I don't know of any agency that isn't looking for for individuals. Yeah, it sounds like everybody. Just talking to Tim Smith, which I do, of course, the St. Albans Mayor, Franklin County Industrial Development Corp. Uh, boy, it's just almost painful. The labor shortage issue just sounds like it's uh, affecting everybody. It sounds like some of the even bigger employers in Franklin County. Uh, it sounds like some of these folks were on shaky ground by just not having enough, uh, you know, work workers. But it sounds like everybody's got that issue pretty much. And in terms of getting uh, new recruits, uh, John, is that something you're always kind of uh, trying to do? Or? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a department-wide mission. You know, yeah. as Sheriff spoke earlier, we're uh, our best uh, advocates are our own folks. Yeah. So we've we've uh, we've incentivized that process as well. We have a, a bonus, a referral bonus that we've that we oh. offer up to our folks now huh. um, when they're able to find uh, people at different levels, whether they're brand new or the level two or level three. Um, so yeah, we're always we're always looking for that. You know, yeah. and. Uh, and natural attrition, you know, we've we've had some folks that have moved on to other organizations or left law enforcement altogether, and that everybody kind of goes through those, you know, those employment challenges. But, but yeah, we like Sheriff said, we're I think we're very in very good shape right now. Um, it's not the ideal situation, but nobody's ideal. You know, every department's understaffed right now, and and it is a struggle. Like, like you said, it's a it's a struggle, community wide and country wide, to get good, capable, dedicated folks to. You know, perform the services that we need. I bet you, you have some female deputy sheriffs, I assume. Yeah, we, we have two. Yep, yeah. we have two, and and certainly the diversifying our uh, deputy yeah. uh, bank is is important to us as well. Um, you know, we're always interested in in having that grow, and and we're very very sensitive to uh, you know some of the racial inequality issues that have been uh, very widely publicized in, in the media you know we want to, to ask be, you guys about that what, what yeah. are you what are you what are you doing about that how, how how are you trying to address that a huge issue nationally obviously huge absolutely it is the the um the race component is has always been a challenge in law enforcement it's not new you know it's yeah. it's always been something that we've we in law enforcement have uh tried to educate ourselves on to the best of our ability um just like with a mental health issue right i mean it, it's there's kind of two schools of thought with that, that, that some law enforcement folks think that, hey, that's not our job. You know, we're not mental health professionals. Um, yeah. The other side of that is the approach that we take, that we say, well, we can get better at that. You know, there's opportunities for us to expand our awareness, and, and we're not going to replace the uh, fantastic work that the mental health community can provide, and we're not going to have two different career paths, right? So we couldn't honestly dedicate the same amount of time to each career path. But... You know, we sure can get better at, at transitioning from 
a, a law enforcement component to an advocate component, you know, and, and I think of it like the switch, you know, I mean, you, you go to a domestic, for an example, and you're, you're in your mind as you're going, you're thinking, okay, you're, you're getting some information from the radio and, and uh, you're thinking, okay, somebody's going to get arrested, right? So you're in that kind of law enforcement approach. And then you get there and you realize that somebody needs services. And, you know, getting better at that transition, you know, of, of kind of pulling back the, the law enforcement component and, and really putting greater awareness and advocacy work around that crisis need, whether, and it could be a mental health need, you know. And, and so we, we think that there's, there's always going to be great opportunities for us to continue education. We've, um, on, the, on, the, on the race component earlier that we talked about, um, we've already done a lot of training for, as far as that's concerned, too. We had a, a local uh, young lady from the community that uh, came in, and she's a, a person of color that came in and spoke to us to share us her experiences. I mean, that was a department-wide uh, required training that we had. Hmm. And it was a great, it was a great opportunity for us to, to hear her struggles um, as, as a person of color in a predominantly white community. And, uh, you know, just gives us some really good, um, really good, really good perspective. You know, I think just, just we're human too. Uh, you know, we kind of get lost in our own day-to-day -day and our, you know, our focus can sometimes be a little too narrow and so these are great opportunities for us to broaden that and, and just be aware of that bigger picture. You know, I mean, uh, I grew up in Vermont my entire life, as, as the sheriff has, and, um, you know, there were very, very few people of color, um, in, you know, when I was a kid. And that's changing. That dynamic's changing. And, yeah. and, and, I, and in our fellow communities, right? So we're seeing a lot of, uh, of uh, non-white people that are coming into our community as well. And so we need to be aware of that. You know, we need to be aware of the cultural differences and, and the things that uh, that make up the their culture and how we can you know assimilate productively and, and be aware of those things and be sensitive to those things and right. any, so, and any any of your staff any people of color on the department staff yeah we do yep uh, yep we just hired a, a young man that's actually he's a he's got a fantastic mental health background as well he's a level two certified guy yeah. um, so we're really hoping to to leverage yeah his experience uh, you know as being a person of color and we haven't really broached that subject with him yet, but yeah. it's kind of been my mind to think about how he can yeah. enhance our awareness to some of the things that he's aware of that yeah. um, that maybe me as a person with white skin, you know, doesn't have that experience or that exposure. And huh. so, and, and his mental health background, he's, he's, he works in a crisis field right now and, and has a tremendous amount of, of experience uh, in that regard. So we're looking at those kinds of things too, you know, and, and how can we incorporate those teachings and those learnings and those different skill sets into our day to day? And, yeah. and how do we share that amongst everybody? You know, yeah. we've got uh, one of our female deputies is uh, pursuing a, a very impressive uh, psychology degree program. She's doing her master's right now, and then she's going to go on to her doctorate program. And uh, I joke with her that she still has to call me captain. I'm not calling her doctor, you know, but uh, but, you know, so things like that. So we're, we're looking at leveraging a lot of that experience and the education that she has and how can we weave that into, yeah. into the fabric that makes up our organization and, and how can we all just be, a, you know, rise, rise up and how can we get to that next level of, of awareness and sensitivity and also being able to provide the services appropriately and, and, and equitably. Yeah. Sheriff, anything? Thanks, thanks, Captain. Anything you want to add, add to that? Again, just a, a little tough, just uh, from, you know, Vermont obviously being about the whitest state out there, but, boy, just a huge issue nationally and stuff, and obviously it's uh, affecting every state, every probably municipality. Yeah, yeah. You know, just in our, our you know, our policies and our training, and, and I'll go back, Richard, to our culture, you know, just treat everyone with respect and yeah. dignity, and, um, <clears throat> and even going back to my days when I was a patrol commander with the state police, I used to tell... You know, the guys on the road, they, you know, they, the consent searchers were very big and, you know, and that type of thing. And I'm like, well, you know, when we review these, we look at what are the indicators to lead you to a consent search. You know, it's like um, because I, and I used to use my own father as an example. If you stop my dad on the road yeah. and you ask to search his car out of respect to you, he's going to say yes. But you've wasted your time, his time, because there's nothing in his car. There weren't the indicators there. Yeah. And that's the level of respect that you need to give individuals, you know. Um, and, and I don't care who it is. Um, I've always, in my policing career, when I was involved in an incident, I, I would go there and I would be asking if this was my family, how would I like it to be handled? Hmm. Um, and I don't care who it was, you know. Um, and I understand going to these places, uh, you know, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of everything, and, and understanding that perspective when you respond yeah. is important. 
um, and that tells you how you're gonna you're gonna handle it. Um, but always handle it like it's your family member, and you will always handle it well, um, no matter who you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, and and I express that a lot now to the deputies. You know, same thing. It's like, you know, if that was your family being treated by a police officer, how would you like that person to treat your family? Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of, you know, it, it's simple, but it worked for me. Um, and hopefully it works for everyone else. And they, ex they know my ex uh, experience and also what my expectations are um, yeah. for that. Um, we'd have a zero tolerance for any of that type of, uh, hmm. uh, anything other than that type of response to, a, to an incident, whether, whether it is with a black person or, or a white person or, yeah. um, you know, that level of respect is, is we, we serve the public and we just need to keep that in mind. I know St. Albans and the city of St. Albans has, I guess, a police advisory commission. I might be a little off on the official yep. name, but just with some of the concerns that have been raised with city PD and just, you know, nationally, anything like that with the sheriff's department, if there was some controversial incident, is there some procedure that, that this would be reviewed by somebody or some, you know, panel or something? Well, St. Albans town has a police advisory okay, board. Okay, the town, town does. The town also. does. Okay. Um, there's not any other towns that we patrol that um, have a police advisory board. Okay. Uh, and it's not that, you know, we're opposed to any. Yeah. Um, however, I, you know, when we went in front of the St. Albans town, it was the, our culture and um, our training schedules and, and our desire to do the right thing, I think, that really got us into, uh, into the town contract. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it just everything surfaces around culture. When something happens in a police department, yeah. you know, you got to look at leadership and where was the supervision, you know, down the line and that type of thing. It starts at the top and comes down. Yeah. Um, and I think John and I have presented pretty well that, you know, we're, you know, we represent the public. We represent the people we serve. Yeah. Um, our deputies know that. Um, we have the community policing philosophy that, um, you know, get out of your cars, talk to people. I don't care if it's a little kid this big or... Yeah. You know, an, an, an adult, um, you know, someone on the side of the road who may need a ride or may just, you know, see what's going on. You know, get out in a caretaking um, incident, you know, not, not necessarily looking to, um, you know, take it to the next level. So, so that's, that's where we're at with, with a lot of our, you know, philosophies on policing. Yeah, I guess slightly related to this kind of the controversy around school resource officers. And, of course, I'm looking at a former SRO at, at SATEC. I think I told you the story of a person who became a friend of mine when you were running for sheriff. She was tempted to vote against you because she didn't want to lose you as the SRO at SATEC. But <laughs> anyway, you moved on to another job. But you feel strongly um, SROs are, again, it seems like there's been controversy. It's been an issue with the, the local school district. But you feel strongly that SROs are a good, a good asset or still see that position very positively? I do, Richard. I, I see that as the, uh, I'll say it again, as the best program in law enforcement. Really? And let me just, you know, and, and I'm not saying any other communities outside of Franklin County. I'm just going to talk about our community. Yeah. Uh, our SRO, for, for example, in Richford, Andre LeBeer, yeah. this summer uh, there was a, a child custody issue. The dad was living up in the Richford area. The mom was out of South Carolina or North Carolina. Wow. She came up with some paperwork supposedly from this court system wow. uh, to, to get custody of her child. Yeah. Uh, she had someone with her who wasn't an attorney, but uh, you know, claimed to pro professing to be you know, as, as educated as an attorney, hmm. and that uh, I needed to override our SRO and allow her, the mom, wow. to take the kid. Yeah. Um, Andre, being as experienced as what he was, um, thought this was pretty. Uh, called the court in South Carolina, learned that the paperwork was false. Wow. Um, so I mean, there's where an SRO had, wow. you know, prevented, you know, a child custody issue crossing state lines, you know, an, an abduction, a kidnapping, if you will. So without that, it sounds like the mother could have probably pretty easily grabbed the kid and taken off. Easily, so, yeah. very yeah. easily, um, and most recently. Um, there were a couple kids at Richford uh, who were on the track team who did not have quality running shoes. Huh. Um, Andre had contacted, I believe it was Foot Locker, huh. uh, and a couple other places, but Foot yeah. Locker stepped feet, up feet. Yeah. and not only feet provided feet. shoes for the Richford team, but also the Enosburg team. Right, really. I mean, I mean, the SROs do a great job. Huh. They're just, uh, if you have the right person, I agree with that statement that people make. Yeah. Um, but if you do, they're so valuable to the, yeah. to the community. Um, you know, and really dealing with a lot of high-risk, at-risk kids. Um, yeah. You know, keeping them on track. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, it's a great program with the SRO. I'll get off that little soapbox. Yeah, but uh, okay. Captain, you see yeah, it the same same way. I assume? Absolutely. You know, we're we're blessed to have really strong SROs. You know, <laughs> we've got uh, Sergeant Jim Lynch in the Enosburg school system, and he's been there for a number of years. And he won this last the last uh, school cycle. He won their Above and Beyond award. You know, he was recognized as as just going above and beyond, and and. Uh, just to, you know, and something that's you know, we'd love to be able to just show all the ways that the SROs really provide value to the community, and not just the schools. And um, one of one of them was was with Andre and Richford and, and Jim and in Eastburg, they were delivering meals. You know, so they were spending their time, you know, going out in their cars and, and bringing food to, to families that needed it. You know, they had the bus systems that would do the traditional routes, but you had places that the buses couldn't go. So they, you know, they would take our cars and, and go up and deliver those things. So again, something that doesn't make the mainstream media, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not a popular thing to look at, but, uh, but incredibly, incredibly valuable and an important thing for the communities to have. Um, we're we're uh, looking at uh, the new, we're hopefully gonna have a new SRO in, in um, Fairfax for the next school cycle. Uh, that person is the same female that I talked to you about before with a mental health background. Um, we're also looking to incorporate some therapy dogs into both the Enosburg school system and the Fairfax school system as well. Um, they, they've had, from what I understand, a tremendous amount of success with that in the St. Albans, uh, you know, BFA St. Albans with St. Albans City PD's deputy, uh, Christine Koch there, and, uh, and, and her dog Murphy, I think, is, is, the, is the, her dog's name. But, um, you know, we, we saw that that was a tremendous opportunity for us to really bridge the gap between law enforcement and, and particularly the children. You know, everybody loves a dog, right? And, and uh, we saw it when we brought our new canine in and had a little public meet and greet. You know, kids that rode their bikes by the sheriff's office every single day came over to say hello because the dog was there. So, so that's a, you have a new, a new canine? We do, yep. Know? Yep, we do have a new canine, yep, for, for the more of the police side of things. But um, is, that the first, is that the first one you've had since you've been sheriff? For, yes, yeah, first yeah. since, yeah. And you see that as a good good addition to the it's department. Fantastic. Huh? Yep. And he's um, yep. Mac. It's with uh, Deputy First Class Tyler Camilleri. Uh, Mac is the dog, and you've probably seen him on Facebook or wherever we posted him. He's huge. So what, what's the main use of the canine unit? So he'll, he's going to be for drugs and for tracking. Okay. Yep. So he's not going to be a, what's traditionally termed a bite dog. So he isn't the, the kind of dog that's going to run after a fleeing felon and you know tackle him that kind of a thing. But he'll be for drugs and for. Uh, search and rescue for tracking kind of things. You know, mm -hmm. somebody wanders away from their home and a, a child or somebody with Alzheimer's or something like that, that he'll be able to go out and find them. Um, but as well as doing drug, drug interdiction work is a, is a big component of, of what he'll ultimately, mm -hmm. ultimately be charged with doing. And, and there, again, there's not enough police officers, there's certainly not enough canines around for us to be able to, you know, call upon their services from a day-to-day -day basis. So, mm -hmm. and, and we might even add another one, you know, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see how the success of this one goes. And, um, and not another one, but you know, uh, the sheriff and I are both dog lovers and dog owners, and we certainly can can appreciate the value that dogs can bring into any situation, whether it's a therapeutic component, like with the uh, with the school resource officers that we're looking to expand, or whether our you know drug tracking and, and uh, you know drug drug detection and, and tracking components. Yeah. yeah. Sheriff, sure, last time we talked, it was uh, one of, one of the issues I didn't get to, but situation with farm workers is. It just kind of struck me as kind of a di dicey issue, but certainly hardly have to tell you. You know, as well as anyone, Franklin County, even with uh, dairy industry taking real hits in recent years, we're still talking a uh, obviously important industry in Franklin County and in Vermont. Although, geez, we're down to what something like 650 dairy farms from you know tens of thousands going back, uh, you know, far enough. But anyway, but I, I guess I'm not even clear. Farm workers, again, just sounds like. Uh, they're key to the dairy industry, typically Hispanic workers, I guess a lot of Mexican workers, some of whom are not here legally. I guess it's not clear to me. What, what are your, you know, how do you, you know, how do you deal with that situation if uh, every once in a while there'll be a, you know, a farm worker who's just picked up or in a car, you know, not on the farm and being questioned and stuff for you? You know, can you deal with those folks like anybody else? I'm not asking this very articulately, but I'm just not clear on what you're supposed to do if you see, you know, a farm worker who may be here illegally. How, how do you deal with that person? Sorry, I'm not asking that better, but yeah. Well, first of all, Richard, been clear to me, I guess. Yeah, we're not we're not the immigration police. You know, yeah. we're not ICE. Um, if they're victims of a crime, 
we'll, we'll, we'll investigate it like any other crime. If uh, if there's a crime committed and they're the offender of a crime, yeah. you know, we uh, we investigate it like any other crime. So their status, whether they're legal or illegal, is basically ir irrelevant. It, it, it is at the state level. It's not anything that we we look into. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't ask it. We just deal uh, with the victim victim or offenders. Yeah. Um, Interesting. It just seems like, uh, to, again, you know, dealing with the dairy industry for decades around here, I mean, good luck finding local folks who want to milk cows. Sounds like these people seem to not exist. And I realize labor shortages for everybody, but it sounds like these folks are the key to propping up uh, the, the industry. But I think it's sad. I grew up on my grandparents' farm in Highgate. That was and, uh, right, literally. and I really enjoyed it and wow. stuff. And I wasn't old think, enough when my grandparents sold the farm. Did you think about hanging with farming or, or not? What's that? Did you think about hanging, making farming a, a living? Well, I, I would have uh, if I was older at the time my grandparents right? sold the farm. Really? Um, oh, really? You know, but, you know, now it's it's hindsight. But, you know, yeah. those are the best times of my life, with, you know, spending time with my grandparents. We'd, yeah. we'd spend sometimes upwards of a month there uh, in the summertime. Yeah. Um, you know, doing the haying and the milking, and that's yeah. a, helping with the barn chores, and yeah. um, you know, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, hindsight being what it is, yeah. you know. Interesting. But again, not a lot of issues. Sounds like I'm not at least reading or hearing about a lot of issues that come up with. Uh, it sounds like most of these folks are working, you know, their tails off for a lot of yeah. hours. So it sounds yeah. like they're not a, a lot of issues that that come up. I guess. No, crime, the issue. Wise. The one issue that we might have is someone who doesn't speak English at okay. all. Yeah. Um, you know, what, and at that what are, point, what are you doing? What are you doing in that case? At that point, we've, um, you know, we've had training recently that we brought into the office through yeah. the U.S. Attorney's Office, yeah. um, where we set up protocols on uh, who we call to set up language translation ser services for this individual. Um, so if we are stopping them for that car stop, you know, they don't have any idea. Well, right at roadside, we'll call dispatch, and dispatch will call um, the proper translation services yeah. for us. Have you got anybody with the department? Any fluent? Any, anybody fluent in Spanish with the department? We have an applicant who's retiring from the Border Patrol, um, who's yeah. looking to retire in June and come on with us, and he's fluent in Spanish. Yeah. Um, although That's... we would still stay with the same policy, right. of calling dispatch and getting. Okay. Even I learned through this training that we took, Richard, that there's several different dialects of a particular language. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll get the correct dialect. We'll get it right the first time, yeah. uh, and then you know deal with whatever the situation is. Yeah. Of course, uh, just thinking of the border, border seems like it's been closed forever, but maybe in the old days when the border was open, that might be an issue once in a while with someone who was French speaking, but yep. I guess probably not. Boy, what do you think about the border? Are we going to ever see the border open again? Sheriff, sure. boy, it sounds like it's going to be a while. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I am, you know, when it's going to open, um, you know, in Canada, I'm not f totally familiar with their situation with COVID, yeah. but I think it's a little worse than ours. I think it's worse. Apparently. I think I, I think even the border between like Quebec and Ontario is closed. Yeah, right. I think it's I think yeah. it's a, many fewer people vaccinated. It sounds like it's uh, I typically catch Montreal news late at night. And yeah, it sounds like it's still a pretty, pretty, pretty big issue up there. Yeah, well, I used to enjoy stopping cars. Uh, and only getting a French-speaking operator because yeah. I could use my French. Uh, so, you, so you can so you can deal with French uh, pretty well. Are you, you know, are you fluent in French? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I oh, used really? to be. I'm Did not as really? fluent as I used to be. Is um, that right? So that's why I enjoyed the challenge of when I would run into a French-speaking wow, driver. Uh, we only hear it in the world. office when he gets angry with something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with your family. No, I bet so. I mean, growing up, you spoke. I mean, French was. Uh, you heard a lot of French just with your family, even? Yeah, my grandparents were, spoke only broken English. Oh, really? On both sides of the family. And uh, huh. um, in my family, my often in, in my household, uh, you know, there were a few sentences in French and then maybe a paragraph <laughs> in English and then a few more yeah. sentences in French. And, Interesting. Um, yeah, so, so you hear French out of this guy every once in a while? Like Kevin? I said, only when, the only when he's mad at something. So I, I try to, I can <laughs> sort of understand. It's more of like just the inflection that he uses in the voice that, that, that uh, clues me into his moods. But yeah, no, don't, don't hear it too much. Sometimes, though, we've, have, we've had a couple of complaints that we've uh, we have. received from some Canadian citizens that might own property here in the state. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, and the sheriff's good to try to pass those phone calls off to us so that we can fluster and mumble <laughs> with it before he takes it over. But. I don't mean to sound crazy here, but the opioid crisis, which I'm sure is still huge, has almost been lost in the shuffle a bit, maybe not to put it very well, just with the pandemic being such a dominant story. The opioid situation, is that about the same same as it was before the pandemic, uh, Sheriff? Any any quick thoughts on, on that? I'm sure it hasn't gone away, obviously. 
No, it has not gone away. Um, I think like, you know, even with the alcohol situation, both of them have risen due to COVID, you yeah. know, the inactivity of people and being home a lot and that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we respond to uh, a number of the overdoses. Uh, we have also set up some training that we're going to have soon with a Turning Point uh, for Narcan deployment again. We're yeah. going to have a refresher on that, and, huh. as well as some of the opioid stats and, uh, and better ways which we can respond to overdose situations. Um, yeah. You know, maybe get someone quicker into um, treatment and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and work a little more closely with, with Turning Point. We're looking forward to that training. Has the, the BART facility on South Main Street in St. Albans, have, have they been able to stay open? Do you know what they're, were they shut down for a while? Do you know? And I, I don't know for you sure, know. but I don't, I haven't heard that they were closed. Yeah. They provide a pretty valuable service. Well, so it I'd seems like I was they, hearing what before, before that facility uh, showed up in St. Albans, a lot of people around here who had to get treatment or whatever were going to either Burlington or, or Newport maybe every day. Right. Boy, good luck driving to Newport every day in winter. Yeah, that's some of the challenges that they face. Yeah. That's right. Just in the, then let, let me ask you this. Down about eight minutes, Captain, about eight yes. minutes left, and I That's covered right. a lot of ground. Anything you want to take a couple minutes on that we haven't gotten into? No, I think we've, we've covered it, right? I mean, I think kind of the big things that the communities are focusing on is, is certainly the budget thing that we've talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've talked about our stance on, on the race, race relation component and, and what we're doing to address those things, the mental health uh, mental health aspects of what we do too. So I think we've, I can't think of anything else that, yeah. that we need Sheriff, sure anything, talk about. anything we haven't talked about you want to jump into here for a few minutes? I still have some more questions, but I just want to make sure you, you're throwing anything out you want to throw out. No, um, you know, I think we covered things pretty well. You know, again, just the community policing aspect of our organization is and talk about that. I, mean, I, know, I know the term. I think a lot of people know the term, but just talk about what, what's community policing exactly. Well, just getting to know the area that you serve. Okay. You know, who are the, the people that are truly in need? Um, you know, one thing I heard through uh, some of this SRO uh, conversation was, some, you know, some kids were afraid of police and stuff. And I, I want us to make those inroads of, like, who's afraid of the police? There's really no need to be afraid of us. Yeah. Um, what I, what I would like to see, Richard, is to see a marked police cruiser go into somebody's yard yeah. and get rid of the preconception that, oh, they must be in trouble, there's a, there's a cruiser in their yard. Yeah. You know, it, we need to be able to stop in somebody's yard it's just to say hi, to talk to them, or, or if it's a child that's a high risk there, to, to yeah. you know, talk to that child or talk to the family, but become part of that solution, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and get away from you know, the heavy handed, if that's what people feel police are, we're not, you know, that's not yeah. what we're about. We're about de-escalation and communication and yeah. how can we help? You yeah. know, uh, you mentioned the opioid issue. I mean, that's what we're doing is true. We're trying to create a better operation for us to be able to help those in need. Yeah. Um, you know, the, our goal is to just to get someone into treatment and have them be successful in, in uh, you know, getting off opioids. That's, that's our end goal. It's not necessarily to make an arrest. Yeah. Um, we're more interested in the dealers uh, versus, uh, you know, those that need treatment. We'd like to see them get treatment. And, and speaking of deal dealers, I mean, I mean, there's stories about drugs coming in, I guess maybe not so much from north of the border at this point, although maybe I'm wrong about that, but here references like Springfield, Mass, New York, but just, you know, drug, drugs coming up through Vermont. Have you got a feel? I mean, Frank, Franklin County, is that drugs coming in from, say, New York to end up in Franklin County or end up may, maybe anywhere in Vermont? Well, we have a deputy that's on the Vermont Drug Task Force. Yeah. Um, he keeps us informed with the trends and, and everything that's going on and yeah. everything that we're seeing up this way. Um, and, it, you know, it comes from just about everywhere. The U.S. mail is a big delivery system for, yeah. uh, for drugs as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like we're not ever going to put an end to it. I think what we need to do is be, you know, spend more in the form of prevention, you know, yeah. to that. Why do people initially, initially start taking drugs? You know, if we can address that, yeah. I think we can, uh, you know, uh, eliminate a good share of the market. Yeah. Gang, gang, gang. It seems like I haven't heard a reference to gangs in Vermont for a while. Are there, is there any gang issues in, in Vermont that comes across your desk or anything or? Yeah, we occasionally get uh, updates from the Vermont Intel Center. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's uh, events going on where they may be passing through yeah. uh, Vermont uh, to get to, to a location. Um, you know, but, um, you know, gangs are, are part of society. They're, yeah. they're here, certainly. Yeah. Um, 
fortunately not as uh, aggressive as they are in some other states. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, we're always vigilant about that. We're always uh, learning more information, and we're always willing to, you know, partner with uh, the communities to say, hey, we know what's going on here, what's going on there, to share information. So. Yeah. I know Richard. And I know Richard had has had a, a, a lot of issues, but law enforcement wise. But I know they they had a meeting with I think the, with the state police commander out of St Albans. And were you part of that also? I was. Yep. And, and, so, and what are you, you know, we're down to about four minutes? But you trying to do changes in law enforcement in Richford, or what's the what's the hope there? It seems like I was reading that it's going to take a while, but we're just trying to get the community more involved, more information from the community about, you know, problems in Richford? Yep. Um, what the state police had set up, Lieutenant Jerry Parton and yeah. uh, Ashley Farmer, Trooper Farmer, was uh, an intelligence-led policing response okay. where uh, anyone who had any information would email that information to the state police. They'd be yeah. the collecting uh, agency for that. Yeah. Um, and then they would share it with with us, essentially, and also, I'm sure, Border Patrol yeah. um, about some, some of the criminal activity that was coming up there. And if they could get enough information to, where it became intelligence, uh, they could respond to it. Um, you know, my understanding is it's, it's happening, but it's just taking some time to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, but in the meantime, uh, you know, Richford had tried a couple of different approaches and, um, you know, we're back up there patrolling on a regular basis. Yeah. And that's a part, that's a, a, is that a seven day contract in Richford at this point or? Uh, currently it is, uh, correct me if I'm It's five, it's right five. Now. Five yep. day contract. Five day. And that's what they're going to commit to uh, uh, okay. July 1st when moving forward as well. Okay. Do you change the, the hours? I don't want you to, you know, tell us anything you shouldn't be telling us, but right. I, do you change the hours? I, I would guess if people know when the sheriff, when a deputy is going to be there, they would purposely maybe not do anything crazy, but right. you change hours or? If not days, sometimes no, or well, yeah, we absolutely do that. Yeah, um, no, typically, we're there to the Tuesday through Saturday. Yeah. You know, those are the nights, the the, the days that are most uh, effective for us to be there. Yeah. Uh, but we do change them up, you know, yeah. for that reason. We don't want to become predictable, right. sure. uh, you know. And it seems to be working out well. We've got some good numbers in, yeah. uh, uh, in Richford, and we've heard some feedback from some of those uh, players in Richford that say, "Gee, we didn't think you'd be here today." Is that right? Um, you know, when they got caught doing something. Right. So. Uh, so yeah, it seems to be working. Um, and I guess it's helpful. I guess I read that. I guess it's helpful when you have a deputy in Enosburg. It's nice to have two deputies not too far away if something something major comes up, obviously, in the uh, other sure. community. Yeah, if there's backup, you know, we uh, we understand there's shortages with the state police and stuff. So we, you know, we need to protect ourselves as far as having some yeah. some nearby backup this quick. Yeah. We rely on our partners with the border patrol quite a lot. So border uh, border patrol is very helpful for, for extremely you folks. helpful. Yeah. You yeah. know, and going back to that saying, Richard, where there's not enough of us, whether it be federal or state. Sure. I mean, public safety is public safety, whether sure. federal or state level. So yeah. uh, so they'll help us out till the situation gets calm, and then they'll they'll take yeah. off. Um, so so it's good. It's. Uh, you know, we're all in about the part partnership relationships with everyone that we can yeah. and uh, provide what we can and then when we need it, hopefully it's there for us. Yeah. A little over a minute left, uh, Captain. Some final final remarks. Anything you want to tell yeah, us? Yeah, just uh, one comment about the community policing thing. You know, one of the things that, that we changed early on was the, <clears throat> the term that we used, you know, like, and I think about our proposals, all said law enforcement proposals. We changed those to police services because we recognize that there's a lot more that we can do. And we think about those quality of, of life things that maybe it's not a law to enforce, but maybe we can be an advocate. Maybe we can be a liaison. Maybe we can be a mouthpiece for somebody that can help them resolve a neighbor issue or something like that. So that, that's what we think of, too, in community policing is doing above and beyond just the arrest stuff, above and beyond motor vehicle work. How can we really get out in the community and make a, a positive impact and, and, and be a great resource uh, for everybody in the community? Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you the last couple. Um, so again, Sheriff, in 30, less than 30 seconds, but big doings in St. Albans Town, taking over in July 1st, but uh, look, looking forward to a, a big challenge for you folks. Yeah, those are we. We're, we're excited. Uh, we got a couple new Dodge Durango, or not Dodge Durangos, we got the- uh, Chargers coming. Dodge yeah. Chargers oh, coming, um, you know, from the town, and, uh, you know, we're excited to accept those. Hopefully they come in the, the near future. Uh, it's up in the air with COVID, but, um, you know, yeah, we're ready to go, and we're excited for July 1st. Very good. We wish you luck. Many thanks to uh, Franklin County Sheriff Roger Langevin, Franklin County Sheriff's Department Captain John Grismore. Thank you. Thanks for the time. <laughs>